Chris Peterson. Right. Yeah, there's six, six of us farmed six together. That's why I have a brother, Brian Bruce. We've farmed together since like 81. We started the partnership and then our sons have joined in. This okay. is our home farm where we grew up. Okay. So what they're rebuilding is the most modern thing you're going to find oh, yeah. in farming. True. Do you want to talk about that? What happened last yeah, September what? Yeah, September 20th we had a tornado came through. We took a direct hit. So it, it wiped out our grain setup. It used to set over on the west side of the buildings. We had 14 bins held around 900,000 bushels. And it, it wiped out the bins and the grain dryer. We lost it shed and a hog barn and a couple little cattle sheds so it kind of wiped out the whole farmstead more or less. Yeah, and where house. were you during the tornado i live across the road we we're in the basement okay so my house, we had a little wind damage, but we didn't get the tornado. I was born in 1958, and my dad didn't really do, he loved the cows, and he wasn't too worried about field work, so I started running equipment when I was pretty young. So I remember planting with a, well, the first tractor I ever drove was a farm all B. That's probably 15, 20 horse. The horsepower, the little tractor I first drove was more or less gardens. Okay. Garden tractor size tractor, now the, the big tractors we have now are 600 horse, and they're, they're pretty massive. Now we have a 36 row planter. Yeah. So the two big bins you can see over there, they're, they'll be for dry corn storage. They, they hold a little over 500,000 bushels a piece. A little bin up on top of the structure, that'll be for when we load grain back out, go in the market. We can pull trucks inside the shed and load. A little bin behind the overhead, we're going to use that like a blending bin, like when we're combining beans, sometimes they're not dry enough to sell, mm -hmm. so we can put the wet ones in there. And then sometimes they're too dry, so we can sort them into bins and blend them together and get them back to 13%. Mm -hmm. so. And that's an uncommon thing. What? The blending bin. Oh, okay. I don't think you see many of those. No, the elevators don't even do it anymore. Yeah. But and explain what an elevator is. Like you see the old time wood elevators, that's kind of the... Like in the main started. street of towns? Yeah. Like small towns? Mm -hmm. Like that conveyor, it'll throw grain into that, and then that, there's a chain with paddles that'll drag corn over to those bins. And these smaller bins will just have a downspout, so from the leg it'll be a pipe going to the top of the bin, it'll just gravity feed from the top. The semis, we built a new road so we can come in They'll face west, and then there's a scale in there, so we can go take a look at it. It's still a work in progress. This red thing is the scale. When we bring the trucks in full of grain, they'll weigh on the scale, and then they'll dump in this pit. And then they weigh again empty, so we get the net weight of the grain. So if the dry grain comes out the bottom, so there'll be, be a conveyor coming off the back of the dryer. It'll feed into this leg, and then we can take it to whatever bin we want to go to with it. All these conveyors and all this stuff is just, could be one of a kind in the state of Minnesota. When it got wiped out, we knew we had to add some storage. So we actually wanted to add a little more than we did, but the cost of it, we had to kind of draw the line somewhere. So. behind us is the new corn dryer. So Chris, how many bushels per I, day or per I think hour? They rate it, it's rated at 6,800 bushels an hour at 10 point removal. So that'd be like if you had 25% corn dry and it's 50, it'd be 10 points. But that's at like an 80 degree outside temperature. So yeah. Minnesota, it'll never dry that much. They're up before it starts drying and so, so that's why we kind of went a little bigger because we knew it wouldn't dry it would have drained and none of them do it's yeah. almost 10,000 bushels of corn so you got to heat the corn up and then the moisture migrates out of the kernel each truckload is a thousand bushels mm -hmm. like each of these bins will probably like 510 loads a piece like we're members of the ethanol co-op down by claremont called alcorn so we sell them corn and also Janesville has a big ethanol plant. We sell them corn. 
We also sell corn to the feed mills, like the Guinea Old Turkey store has a feed mill we sell corn to. And some of our corn goes up to the like Savage River terminals, so that goes mainly for export. Well, like Guinea Old, they make turkey feed. So and Genio is the turkey company. Yeah, like it's a owned national by Hormel. Tur- yeah, yeah Genio turkey stores. Mm-hmm. So we sell them quite a bit of corn because they're close. So that they make turkey feed with it. Mm-hmm. You know, we feed hogs also, so we take corn to the feed mill in Hayfield. That's mm-hmm. where feed, they grind corn and then they put soybean meal and amino acids, vitamins, and stuff with it, mix it together, and that's what makes the hog feed. Mm-hmm. So that becomes the feed. Yeah. Okay. Which is like the food. Yeah, for that's the, what they eat. For the little turkeys. <laughs> yeah, turkeys, chickens, beef cattle. There's several different kinds of livestock in Minnesota. So. Well, we raise hogs for market. We sell them the Smithfield Foods. We're in a feeder pig co-op, so we buy feeder pigs out of the co-op, and then we finish them. So we have hogs. On this farm, we have hogs on four other farms. So we usually have around 14,000 pigs on feed at a time. We buy them, they're like 45 pounds, and then we usually sell them when they're market weight about 290 pounds. It takes usually around 107 days or so to sell the first load. So they'll go from 45 pounds to 290 pounds, a little over 100 days. They call it harvesting the hogs, so they they kill the hogs and butcher them, cut them up, and you know, make the different cuts. And, they make bacon and hams and loins. They sell them to grocery stores. You see Smithfield, just about all the stores. They're one, they actually grow pigs also, Smithfield does, so they're, they're big. I can see why you have wind issues here. Yeah. Yeah, and you were saying before you had a couple tornadoes in the last how many years? Yeah, back I think 2000, there's a tornado come across the field that got probably within 600 feet of our building site and turned one over, wiped out that See the top of that shed, that guy lost his house. The other thing that happened to him last fall is when the wind came through, it knocked all the corn over. So they had to go get special devices to pull the corn up before they could harvest it, as they were harvesting it. Mm -hmm. Some big reels on the corn head to pull it in. So uh, you were able to salvage the corn then? Most most of them we could get into the combine. you had to be right. When the corn's standing, you run the corn at like a foot off the ground, any rocks or anything, you go right over. When the corn is flat on the ground, you had to. So we'd scoop up all the little rocks and stuff too, along with the corn. So. I rode with them last year for a little bit, and you could hear the rocks clunking around in the corn head, but the, they have a place to go, so then he's got to get out and empty the rocks out. So, yeah, so last yeah. year was a bad year for these this family. So harvest took about twice as long as normal. We did a lot of damage to the equipment. It's like it was a wet spring this year, so we got started planting late. We planted we started on the fourth of May and our very last field we planted the third of June. So that's normally you kinda wanna have the corn in by the tenth of May. It really got late this year. So when is harvest? Uh, usually we start like the end of September, but it's going to be later this year, probably be October. For yeah. soybeans. So, yeah. For soybeans. And, but this corn looks good though, doesn't it? Yeah. It's, this, it's caught up. It's This got planted like the 5th of May, so it's towards the beginning. So the, the earlier planted corn is, of course, way ahead of the stuff planted the 25th of May. So hoping we keep the frost away, and then we need some nice weather to finish it off. Yeah. Yep, so you're like, at the mercy of rain. Chris, what were the uh, factors for the reason to go and rebuild everything for the future of the family or? That's mainly because our sons are farming and they're really good kids and they have a good work ethic so we're kind of building it for the next generation. If they weren't farming with us we probably wouldn't have rebuilt at our age of 60 so we wouldn't have spent this kind of investment just for another 10 years or whatever we're going to farm. So this kind of investment, it'll last 50 years easy mm-hmm. right now. I love that. So. Investment in the family for the yeah. future generations, yeah. right? Like in the hog business, we export probably about 25% of the pork out of the U.S. with 
China has a disease over there. They've lost about 30% of their pigs. And so that's more pigs than the U.S. has combined. So they should be buying our pork. But they have this tariff trade war going on. So they're they're digging their heels in and Trump's digging his heels in. So they, you know, they're not buying any U.S. ag products. And they wanted to buy ethanol too. Like their environment over there is their air is really polluted so they had plans to buy a bunch of ethanol we're in the ethanol business and then they buy corn soybeans and they buy you know pork pork is kind of their main meat so pork right now in the u.s is very cheap it's below the cost of production but if we were selling china just a little bit of that pork we'd have a lot better price so what do you predict is going to happen what well eventually they're going to have to get it settled because china settled they send like three times the stuff over here that we send back. So it's hurting their economy big time too. So eventually they're going to get it settled. Right now they're like little kids playing at the playground. Like it's, you know, it's ridiculous. It's been going on over a year. And part of it's political too. We have a trade agreement with Mexico and Pelosi has been sitting on her desk for nine months and she won't bring it to a vote to approve it because it, it'll make Trump look better. So, so there's political stuff going on that's it's hurting everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, this building has like 2,160 pigs in it right now. There's two rooms, over a thousand in each. Yeah, there's plenty of room. Like the pigs, they're curious, so we're out here. So like when we first came, there wasn't any pigs along the wall here. And then when we came, they're all coming over to see what's going on. They're just curious. So you went inside in the back, there's you know there's all kinds of room for them. Yeah, we've had quite a few different farm group tours from all over the world at the farm. We had one this summer. There's people here from about 15 different countries. We've had quite a few people from China. The, like the Corn Growers Association and the Minnesota Soybean Growers, they'll, they're promoting our products, so they'll have people over. We're close to the city, so they like bringing them out here. Usually, we try to do a lot of maintenance in the winter time, like the planter now. We work on it during the winter, so now we have a heated shop again to work in. So we have a, we have a 60, Put wide door on that end so when we have the combines of the like the bean heads are 40 feet wide so we can drive in with the heads on when we have a pit over here to change oil in the semis so the semis will drive over the top of that hole and then we can change oil in the next behind the curtain we have a wash base we can wash all of our equipment and trucks so this whole area is heated and then we have a 50 foot storage on the end where we're going to put all of our seed have fertilizer on the planter that goes in the ground with the seed. So we to help. put a little phosphate, it's got a little nitrate phosphate and some zinc we mix with it. So that goes right in the furrow with the seed. So they call it pop-up fertilizer. But the the fertilizer in the planter, is that dry? That's or liquid. Liquid, yeah. So that, they actually dissolve the phosphate. They use like coke acid and dissolve it. So that, it's, a, it's in the liquid form. This, compared to 50 years ago, is a complex setup, including planting, harvesting, fertilizer. fertilizers. Mm -hmm. Like now, when we spread fertilizer, it's all done by a prescription. So we take soil samples on every two and a half acres. It's a grid, and then, so it, we spread it to what it needs. But same way the planter, we have a prescription, so we have our soil's real variable, so we have some like sandy soil. We cut the population way down on that because if it gets dry at all, it won't even make it here. So we, we got a few little, just a few spots that are real light. We'll plant like 22,000, and then our best ground gets like 38,000. So when you do the soil sample, where do you send it? Who does the yeah, prescription? We send it to a lab. It's Minnesota Valley testing. So they have a machine that will tell you how much phosphate Pot ashes in the soil. Every few years they have to add lamp, lime to the soil also. So that testing will tell them. And all the equipment, by the way, is all computerized. Combines, 
combine knows exactly what the yield is, which, where it is. And that's how they base their uh, planting process is probably off the combine, isn't it, when you yeah, harvest? Yeah, we have a, like when we plant, it records everything. So say you actually had half the planter with one variety and the other half with a different variety, you can record that. So when we're combining, it'll tell you in the combine which variety you're combining. It oh, knows wow. where it was planted. So that, it's pretty slick. So it's a very expensive process too. Everything that has to go into yeah, the farming. The, yeah, the computers like to record the, like the yield maps, they're like $6,000 a piece. We got one, you know, each sprayer, each spreader, most of the tractors have the combines. Yeah, but, but like all the fertilizers and all yeah, the it's, testing and, and, yeah. every, and just everything. They actually spray the corn after it's planted. Herbicides are what you use to kill weeds and pesticides will kill insects. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we'll have to spray for aphids and lately we've had a lot of Japanese beetles and mm -hmm. we have these caterpillars that mm -hmm. were eating beans like crazy. So we gave the beans a shot of insecticide. <laughs> well, like the insecticide we use like on the beans, we usually spray them, you know, it's in July and you don't harvest till October. Usually the insecticides, the label says, you know, about nine days. So they're they're pretty well gone by the time <coughs> you harvest anything. Now this year there are some grasshoppers in the beans and we sprayed, we sprayed mainly to get the soybean aphids, but there was some grasshoppers in there also. If you didn't get rid of the grasshoppers, they'll eat the beans right up. That's so they're not good. Mm -hmm. And, the and that's the problem you have out in the Dakotas. This grasshopper. I know, I read Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> <laughs> they had issues. And the locusts, too. Was yeah. that, you don't have that, though? No, we haven't had those. Okay. And nowadays, it seems, you know, the big craze is GMO free and GMO this and that, not to have GMOs. But it's basically that people don't understand what it really is. And what is it so, genetically? So GMO stands for genetically modified organism. So it, it can be different things, but like in our business, we have corn, we used to have a lot of trouble with the rootworm. So they would eat the roots right off the corn. So we had to use a real heavy dose of insecticide. It's bad for people to handle. It's very bad for the environment. Well, then they bred the corn so it has this bacillus protein in it. So when the rootworm would eat the, the roots, it would actually starve. They couldn't digest the protein, so it would starve the rootworms. So we don't have the rootworm problems. Now we don't have to use the soil insecticide. So we think it's a lot safer for us and groundwater and everything else not using the heavy dose of insecticide. And so now they also bred, used to have trouble with corn boar, they called it. They'd bore through the stock and then they'd eat the shank of the, of the ear where it attaches to the stocks and the, a lot of the ears would fall off in the fall. But now they've bred so it's resistant to that also. It's, it's a similar type of rootworm. So it's, so we from a farmer's point of view, a GMO is actually better. And we have way more production too. It, mm -hmm. It's helped the yield. So. Mm -hmm. And you think, and it's safer. Yeah, for we everybody. think it's safer. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot of maintenance. Yeah, all the bet. tractors and trucks. And we have a bulldozer, excavator. And yeah, so it's yeah, a, lot it's of a stuff nice big it. operation. Again, for your future family. So well yeah. done. Well done. Thank you. Well, Anything else? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. You're this was very informative. Good seeing you. Appreciate it. to the Peterson farm after the tornado. The very next day there was a many people there helping, friends, neighbors, and relatives, helping clean up that whole mess. The insurance company was there within a couple days and left them a check to get going. Started on it.